Not at the moment. So, so we are still short right at the moment. Dr. Goldman, my office is upstairs, all the way at the end of the hall, in the natural science area, room uh, 370G. G for Goldman. Jimmy Duke is in D. I don't know. <laughs> He's in A, I guess. Um, my number and my email address is on the syllabus here, so if you contact me, you can get a hold of me there. As I said, this is, a, this is a General Physics 3 with a Calculus Physics 218. In the Alabama course description, uh, it says something, um, it has a real long paragraph. It says something about, um, we will investigate Schrodinger's equation and the Intricate, intricate parts of quantum mechanics or something like that. I think this course had been taught once by somebody at some community college and they had gotten the course approved and the, the fellow just decided he was going to teach some quantum mechanics. And I don't know what happened after that but it was still on the books. So we're, we took this course and said, okay, we'll teach physics three. And under the head of mind too. So uh, our objective is to 
actually cover some quantum mechanics at the end and some relativity. But I also include thermodynamics, which we did not cover in physics one and two, and optics, which we should be in the physics three course anyway. So we have thermodynamics, optics, relativity, and quantum mechanics. So that's our objectives, uh, to uh, teach the classical theory and phenomena of thermodynamics, optics, relativity, and quantum mechanics through the medium of classroom exposition, laboratory experiments, and problem solving by mathematical methods, including calculus. In fact, the calculus was invented so that we can do the physics. I can say that when I have the pulpit. Grading system, exam total 80% of your grade, laboratory 20% of your grade. I envision three tests, All right, so two midterms and a final for this course, not four, but three. Uh, divided, basically having the first exam on thermodynamics, the second exam on optics, and the last exam on relativity and quantum mechanics. So just divide it, the subject matter in that way. Um, so only three exams. The last exam will not be comprehensive. It will just be over the last stuff that we do, which will be the uh, relativity and, and quantum mechanics. Uh, evaluation of student would be appraised if your work continuously, primarily through test results, homework assignments, class participation, and laboratory performance. Um, most of it is that is your grades on the test, 80%. Labs, 20%. 10 labs, uh, you'll, actually 11 labs are allowed to drop one. Most people just do 10 labs. And, uh, um, so of that 20%, each lab is worth 2%. I mean, if you had an average and your final average was 91, but you didn't hand in one lab, that, would, that could lower you down to 89. Right? So, yeah, yeah. so each each lab is 2% of the grade. So, at the very least, you want to hand in something for lab. Attendance policy. This is kind of written in the old manner for attendance policy, and I'll read it here. Important subject matter will be covered in class every class meeting. Because of this, poor attendance will adversely affect the student's grade. Students who miss class should try to obtain the notes or pertinent information from other students or consult with the instructor. Well, the, and the notes are here. So, and, and this, is, this is cheap. Yes. Has anyone bought this yet? I can't get close until the first day of school. Really? Yeah. You got <laughs> paid for and scholarship. Scholarship, but you can't do it until the first day. First year, fifteen bucks. Something like that. Wow, what a deal! Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, actually, I don't think we get any money back on this, but uh, it's got my lecture notes that I'm going to be going over here, except for the last couple chapters I'm still working on, the, the quantum mechanics chapter. I saw you working on that one too, the quantum mechanics. <laughs> and I'm still working on it. I started reading the book too. Last, last <laughs> last <week. laughs> really? Yeah. Excellent. It's, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I'm going to have you teach that when we get there. Is that all right? Later, 
lab measurements in there too. So every all included, all inclusive. Fifteen bucks. Um, you probably would want to buy the book too if you don't have the book. That might be a hundred and fifty dollars. It's, it's up there, yeah. Do you have the book? I did. I just sold gas money. Are you gonna buy it again? Theoretically, you could survive on the notes, and the book will help fill in all the, you know, pertinent information in between, and help explain things to all the this, this is like the cliff notes, you know. The book is the real thing. Um, back to the tenants uh, policy, because this semester, we've got some changes. Have you heard about this? This month they're changing. They changed last. They changed, they changed, they changed it last summer, and now they're changing it again to less absences. Yeah. yeah. Well, not only that, we we have been trained. In, when I should have been working on my quantum mechanics lectures, we we had special training to input your attendance online. What happens is the amount of classes you need each week, half it multiplied times two. Wait, that's in the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> we're going to enter attendance every day, like electronically. It'll be there electronically. Um, I think, uh, I'm pretty sure that the ultimate decision about um, whether or not you've had enough attendance in class, whether or not you failed due to attendance or, or that sort of thing or withdrawn, is with the instructor. So I think that decision is still with the instructor. I don't think it automatically would, would boot you out. Boot you out. Except for, what would it affect? Okay, so uh, everybody understand the intense 
policy? It is three axes of right. Is that what it is? That's what it is for my other. Okay. Like I said, I think as far as the course is concerned, I think still the instructor's decision. <coughs> and I, I probably would not make that decision without consultation with the student. Uh, but as far as financial aid goes, it might be. Yeah, what it used to be is if you had many semesters, you half the amount of days you made. And if you had a, a full semester, you double the amount of days you made. Right, so it should be four, right? That's what you're saying? So it could be four. I don't know. Do you know for a fact that it's three? I'm pretty sure it's three. I understand it's kind of just what's possible. Let's see. Okay. Maximum number of absences. Semester you double it by two. Yeah. Since we're fifty percent less in a accelerated ten week semester, or thirty three percent less. It just yeah. goes down to three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Withdrawal policy. Uh, I think there's a date that you can still withdraw from the course. Um, and I can withdraw you with my. I think right up until the last day. Uh, makeup policy. If you miss exams for excused reasons, you should contact me immediately. Schedule a time for makeup. Probably what I'll do is put the makeup exam in the Science Learning Center and make it up there. The penalty is that you do not have the option of the extra credit problem. So, if, for those of you who haven't had me before, there is a possible 105 points on the exam because um, <clears throat> generally I have a matching page and then uh, I have uh, some multiple choice questions. Those kind of get you on the board. And then I have a problem section where you're asked to do probably six problems. And that section is worth 60 points on and they go from easier problems to harder problems. So there's kind of two, which I would consider straightforward and easy problems, two medium, and then two hard. And the last one of that two is the hardest one, which I call the exit credit problem. The exit credit problem. Disabilities. If you have a disability that might require special material services or assistance, please contact Calhoun's Disability Services Office and the Chastain Student Center and, or call one of those numbers and let me know so I can make this the uh, best possible experience for you. On the back of this syllabus, I have a suggested um, schedule for lecture. I think uh, it's, it's kind of uh, energetic to begin with. Today we'll cover chapter 19, the first chapter in the thermodynamic section. Uh, and if you look at that, we're almost doing a chapter a day for a while. Uh, and then in the last section, we've got more time, spend a lot more time on the chapter in relativity, which is in your book, only one chapter. but. Um, we really need some time to absorb some of the ideas that are there. And, uh, and then more time for the quantum mechanics. Now, I'm not sure 
if we can stick to this schedule. All right. Uh, last summer, I think we had a couple less days as well, but last summer we uh, we finished the relativity, and that was it. And in fact, we actually skipped one of the chapters. We skipped uh, chapter 38. Uh, so uh, I I think we're gonna have, we're gonna move faster this semester. One of the reasons that we we uh, went a little bit slower. This is the first time I taught the course. And also, uh, we didn't have a recitation, so I spent a lot of time uh, working out problems on the board. And I, I still expect to spend a lot of time working out problems on the board, but maybe not as much. Uh, one of the things that I've done over the course of this last year was, uh, with the help of uh, Damon Stevens, uh, was record all the problem sessions um, um, a record on video. So I have done all the um, the problem sets that that you would get in this volume. Uh, worked out every problem on the board and it's been recorded, and that is available on the math site already. I think most of them. Are. Most of them are. When when will uh, this particular class be? Generally about 20 minutes after the class. Oh, really? <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it is. It is pretty incredible. What do we do? Did you look at the location? Go to the Calhoun site. Then go to calhoun.edu slash math. three were similar to the others so that they could uh, so it would help them solve the other problems. I think we'll get beyond that, but I don't know for sure. So if, if we if adding chapter 38 slows us down, then I want to still have that option of trying the same thing because I thought it was pretty fun. This whole class I, I think will be fun. I, I envision it to be a lot, a lot of fun because it's just 
meet subject matter and uh, uh, meet people. I have a question on, uh, it's, it's just a personal, personal choice. Most, most people look at mass and they just think of it as mass. But do you think of it as invariant mass or relativistic, relativistic mass, whatever it is? Or do you just think of it all as mass? Did you ask me personally? Well, level. some physicists, you know, just call it all mass. Can I just get away with that? <laughs> no, I, I don't think of it as uh, mass. I mean, I think of it as all interconnected. Personally, I think of mass and energy being the same. And it's all interconnected. Uh, you know, you get one, one is the other. Uh, and in terms of physical mass, I'm, I'm more of a person who thinks of the universe as a fabric, and, and mass is just uh, something that that alters that fabric properly. Yeah. Of course, there was somebody recently who came out and said that uh, um, we think of this fabric as being too too intense, and that it's more spread out. And because of that, I think they're publishing in the physical review letters. Because of that. Um, black holes are not so singular. You know, mass of black holes, we always think of them as a singularity at one point, but because the universe is more expansive than, than what we thought or what was proposed, someone at Penn State, uh, <clears throat> that things would be able to uh, escape black holes because it's, it's not such a point. There's also Incidentally, if, um, if this class suddenly ends before the end of the summer, it could be because of a black hole, right? Because sometime over this summer, um, the uh, Hadron Collector um, at CERN, um, the Hadrons are basically protons accelerate to very high velocity, uh, 0.99999% speed of light. And they're going to collide these things, and they're going to involve energy of terajoules. The energy is so high that uh, it's believed by some people that it could create a little black hole right there on the border of France and Switzerland. And if they create a little black hole, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. You know, some physicists believe, well, if it creates a black hole, it'll soon dissipate. And then other people are thinking, well, if it creates a black hole, it'll just start sucking everything in and start building itself. And, uh, and, and of course, if that happened that way, then it'd be over really pretty fast. It would happen in France first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> French would go at first. <laughs> Which would be a bad thing, because right now they're playing the French Open. Well, it's <laughs> I really want to see the results of that. <laughs> so, okay, well, that's uh, that's our course, and my plan today is to uh, start chapter 19, the thermodynamics. So let's take a look at that. That's uh, that's pretty cool. But that's uh. 
uh, actually on the subject. If you can repeat that in about five minutes. <laughs> We are going to start through with dynamics, and uh, there's a few laws in terms of dynamics. It's kind of There's a few laws of thermodynamics. The more famous ones are the uh, first law of thermodynamics, which is the conservation of energy, which we'll get to a little bit later. And the second law of thermodynamics, which is um, the law of entropy, the law of disorder with time. We'll get to that later, too. But I guess once you set up the first and second law and figure, well, we should have had our law before that, then you go, well, okay, well, let's have the zeroth law. All right, we'll just go back. You know, if you need another law before that, you go to a negative one law, I guess. And here's the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Say it like this. When body A is in thermal equilibrium with body C, and body B is in thermal equilibrium with body C, <coughs> then A and B will be in thermal equilibrium with each other if placed in thermal contact. A transit. Kind of. If you say that A is in thermal contact with C and B is in thermal contact with C, then if A and B were brought together, they would be in thermal equilibrium. What this basically defines is temperature. Thermal equilibrium results when two objects cease to have the heat exchange between them. If there's no heat exchange between them, they are said to be at the same temperature. So objects at the same temperature will not exchange heat. With that definition of temperature, we have temperature scales. The Celsius temperature scale defines zero degrees Celsius as the ice point of water and 100 degrees Celsius as the steam point of water, the boiling point of water. So you have 100 degrees perfectly between uh, the two points, the two major uh, phase changes of water. Which is a good thing because water is very important to us. 95% of our body, anywhere we want to be, water better be there. So let's define a scale based on water. The problem with the Celsius scale, if you define zero degrees as the ice point of water, then you're going to end up with negative temperatures as you go below that. And uh, for science, especially in equations in science, you don't want to have negative temperatures because sometimes you have an equation that might be temperature squared or temperature to the fourth. And when you put negative temperatures in there, it really, uh, you, don't, you don't know whether it's negative or positive because the uh, negatives are canceled out. So you really need a scale that starts at zero. So you take the Celsius temperature and you find out where absolute zero would be, which would be at minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, and you define that as zero on what is called the Kelvin scale. So the Kelvin temperature is equal to 273.15 plus the Celsius temperature. And that's our conversion. The Kelvin scale starts at absolute zero. Fahrenheit is designed, um, the guy looked at a circle, and uh, you know how a circle is like 180 degrees is straight line. So he designed um, an arbitrary, which is to make this up, that between freezing and boiling, there should be 180 degrees. That's how it was designed? Yeah, I didn't know that. Arbitrary. He thought, you know, since one's on the opposite, the other's on the opposite, if you look at a circle, that would be 180 degrees. Right. So he said, all right, there should be 180 degrees between. So our thermometer should be like uh, like a half circle. Yes. 
temperature is 4.2 degrees Kelvin. That's uh, where it liquefies. Uh, on a personal scale, um, I was able to get down to 1.6 degrees Kelvin. That's the lowest I ever got when I was working with this kind of stuff. And the way I did it was um, you have liquid helium, which is 4.2, and then you, you take a vacuum and you start evacuating the, the space above the liquid helium. By taking away those the gas molecules above the helium, you create a little vacuum. Uh, by um, diffusion, the helium is trying to fill up that space. So it starts putting atoms up into that space. And that requires energy to uh, put those atoms into that, occupy that space. And that takes energy away from the liquid helium, cools the helium down. I was reading uh, uh, some scientists did a project on Bose-Einstein condensation. And they use, you know, Standard ways to get down to a certain level. That's they, what they used, um, like, I think, like blue lasers or something, lasers to get yeah. down to like a spin. To get down to within like a ten thousandth of absolute zero. And then what they did is they, they like, sort of had a cut and they sort of bounced and just sort of, you know, until nothing else could be. Nothing else could be. Mm -hmm. True absolute zero could never be achieved because there's, there's a certain amount of energy associated with just the ground state spin in uh, an atoms, and you can't eliminate that. So, ten, one minute of a calvin is pretty good. Liquid hydrogen uh, is 14 degrees Kelvin. I'm, I'm a person of, again, one of the few people that have actually seen solid hydrogen and crystalline form. Another experiment that I wasn't working on, but another graduate student was working on, and I helped them out. And we, we spent uh, the weekend crystallizing hydrogen. And uh, it looked like a piece of ice, but um, that was kind of neat. Liquid nitrogen, 77 degrees Kelvin. Water freezes at 273 degrees Kelvin. This is all in the logarithmic scale, so it goes right up pretty fast. Copper melts at 1,000 degrees Kelvin, around there. The surface of the sun is 6,000 degrees Kelvin, just the surface. The interior of the sun is 10 million degrees Kelvin, actually probably closer to 15 million degrees Kelvin, which allows uh, fusion to take place. And the center of a hydrogen bomb going off might be on the order of 100 million degrees Kelvin. The corona is actually hotter than the surface. That's right. So it, it's kind of weird because it decreases and then it increases. The corona goes up to 3 million degrees Kelvin. So that's because there's no mechanism to take the heat away once you, once you get out beyond the surface. Uh, if we ever get into a hydrogen bomb, I want to be in the center, so. <laughs> it takes about 100,000 years for the light right from the fusion reaction to reach the surface of the sun. How long? About 100,000 years. 100,000 years? For atoms from the center to photons. Photons? For light to reach the surface of the sun. Because photons create I need to have you sit up here with all these fun facts. Just kind of face the class whenever we need them. That's great. That's great. 100,000 years for photons to make yeah, it It's, it's kind of like the chaotic journey or something. The journey that you, because it's, it's chaotic. It's right. Really, so 
takes you know about a hundred thousand years. Because huh. you got that radiation zone and you got convection zone. Mm -hmm. and so you so know, convection it, zone. It can get pushed back down, back up, okay. and go. Yeah. All right. huh. The Fahrenheit scale. I heard that the Fahrenheit scale is based on 30 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> <laughs> it defines 32 degrees as the ice point of water, 212 degrees as the steam point of water. So a difference of 180 degrees. Hence, every Celsius degree is 9 fifths that of a Fahrenheit degree, because Celsius is only 100 degrees between those two points. And our conversion looks like this. Temperature in Fahrenheit looks as 9 fifths the temperature in Celsius plus 32. If you were to change the temperature between the two scales, a change in temperature on the Kelvin scale is the same as a change in temperature on the Celsius scale. So they have the same size degrees. <coughs> Whereas a change in temperature on the Fahrenheit scale is 9 fifths the, ch the change in temperature on the Celsius scale. These are useful conversions here if you're dealing only with changes in temperature, not actual temperature values. Last one is very easy to drive. I'll do that real quick. If you had the uh, final temperature in Fahrenheit, that's 9 fifths temperature, in, uh, initial temperature in Fahrenheit, 9 fifths temperature initial in Celsius was 32. <coughs> final temperature, 9 fifths temperature in Celsius was 32. So if you had a difference in temperature, you would have 9 fifths temperature in Celsius was 32 minus 9 fifths temperature initial. 32, 32s cancel out. And so dealing with changes in temperature is a lot better than just dealing with actual temperatures themselves. And you'll see that in problems when we get there. Thermal expansion of solids and liquids. You find that uh, in general, if you have a temperature change, not a drastic temperature change, but a normal temperature change, that uh, things will expand, and the, the expansion will be proportional to that temperature change, the amount of that change, and also be proportional to your original dimension, in this case, the length. So we would say that we have some kind of uh, equation that we set up, that our change in length is proportional to our original length, and also proportional to the change in temperature, and uh, we make a proportionality constant, which is our linear coefficient of expansion. And it turns out that the linear coefficient of expansion for steel is the same as that for some forms of concrete, right? Similar. Yeah, it's similar. similar. Yeah. So that, that way it, it doesn't crack when it expands. So it doesn't crack when it expands. If you, you have rebar, reinforced concrete, and you're building tall structures, you don't want them to expand at different rates, and hence crack under temperature. Here's how it works for a linear expansion in one dimension. Start with the original length, heat it up, it expands a certain amount, change in length. And alpha is a code for the linear expansion, which depends on the type of material that you have. So your new length will be your original length plus this change in length. A lot of times just, I would just think of it that way. So here's your change in length, and if you had a new length, it would be that original length plus that. What you could write using mathematics as your original length times 1 plus the linear coefficient times the change in temperature. You know, this, this, uh, this result for expansion and this change in length, it applies to any dimension, even if you're looking in terms of a two-dimensional expansion or a three-dimensional expansion. If you select one dimension in particular, 
in that expansion, then this equation applies for that one dimension. Here's an example where we have a two-dimensional object. We look at it, uh, a donut with a hole in it. And we heat it up. This is my, this is my universal symbol for heating something up, for bringing a torch. Right. So you heat it up, and it expands. Right. What expands is the whole object. Right. So that object also includes the hole. So, not only does the diameter expand according to this expansion, but also the diameter of the hole expands. Right? All aspects of that object expand. The application you can loosen a tight metal lid on a glass jar by running hot water over it. The uh, metal would expand better than the glass, hence, an inner diameter as well, hence, uh, the lid gets loose. You can get it off. But the hole expands with the same linear coefficient as the material in itself. Right. You can imagine that if this were a solid material, it would expand. Right. The material that is beyond that radius where the hole is generally doesn't have any brain, so it should expand the same way where the material were there. And if it's not there. Yeah. There's a certain brain that's designed with a five metal strip. That way, if there was a, an expansion between them, they expanded different rates, which would trip the smooth. That's, that's a very interesting idea. Have you bought the notes yet? Like, like a thermostat? Well, I, I believe they might have a similar principle. And so a speedometer in a car uses, um, it, it turns like an electromagnet, which um, Changes like the temperature of a, a strip inside, and you know your speed. The faster it goes, the stronger the field. The but can you uh, can you explain this? <laughs> you know that a uh, thermostat by metallic strip. Uh, <laughs> I don't even have the notes <laughs> yet. I love it. Brass uh, has a, a linear coefficient of. I'm gonna let you explain. It. <laughs> well, they have two different uh, coefficients of expansion, and one expands faster than the other. All right, so here's brass, 19 times 10 to the minus 6. Here's steel, 11 times 10 to the minus 6. So, yeah, brass factor of 2. All right, well, let's say we have an electrical connection here on a uh, thermostat, and we've got the uh, brass on the inside. So the brass is going to expand more than the steel, which is on the outside. All right? It heats up. What's going to happen? You know, international symbol, heat. The brass expands more than the steel, so we're going to have a little bit of a torque there on the end there, where one's pushing this way and the other one, as a result, not pushing as much, but pushing the other way, and causes an angle to that torque and uh, releases the electrical connection. Right? And then that would stop, you know, you can say it's got it hot enough so it would stop whatever application doesn't need to be run at that temperature. <coughs> okay, let's consider the expansion of an area. Let's say it's the original area. We've got two dimensions. L not L not would start with the square. So I would say that this area is equal to L not the square originally. But it expands under temperature. Now the linear expansion would be the same in both directions. So now we have a new area, which is L versus L or L squared. But we know that each uh, dimension will change by this amount, 1 plus alpha delta t. So I would say my new area is L naught times 1 plus alpha delta t, all this quantity squared, which will give me an L naught squared. And then as I expand this square, I end up with 1 plus 2 alpha delta t. And I have a term over here, which is alpha squared delta t squared. 
alpha is a really small number. Alpha for the brass, we don't have it up there anymore, but it was uh, 19 times 10 to the minus 6. Right? So, if I have an alpha squared term, that's going to be something times 10 to the minus 12, and that's going to be extremely small compared to these other two terms. So, I can basically say that that's basically zero. All right? And so this simplifies into my new area equals um, my original area, a naught times 1 plus 2 alpha delta t. So for an area expansion, with a linear expansion coefficient of alpha, our expansion coefficient is the same form, but it's 2 alpha for a two-dimensional area. And sometimes it's called gamma. Uh, it's just twice the linear coefficient. So, hence, we got the linear expansion. Length equals original length, 1 plus alpha delta t. Or area expansion. Area equals original area, 1 plus 2 alpha delta t, where this gamma is 2 alpha. And if I do the same thing for volume expansion, I could do the same sort of thing with lots of terms falling down because they're so small. And I would find that my volume expansion will equal my original volume 1 plus beta delta T, where beta happens to be equal to 3 alpha. Right. So you can do those three expansions in up to three dimensions. What you say the beta? Uh, this one, gamma, yeah. beta. However, any particular single dimension is expanding according to linear expansion. So when you read problems, you have to read specifically what they're referring to. And if they're, they're saying a hole expands and the diameter went from, from original diameter to a larger diameter, you think a hole, and that's two-dimensional. But they refer to the diameter expanding, and that's one dimension. So you have to kind of read the problem and decide what's actually the, the quantity that you are focusing on. Here's an example. A hole of cross-sectional area, 100 square centimeters, is cut from a piece of steel at 20 degrees centigrade. What is the area of the hole if the steel is heated from 20 degrees to 100 degrees centigrade? The hole will expand just like the material around it. Original area is 100 square centimeters. Heat it up. Alpha coefficient for steel is 11 times 10 to the minus 6. <clears throat> so the hole is going to expand in area from the 2 alpha. The new area will be 100 times 1 plus 2 times alpha for steel, changing temperature to 80 degrees. So the new area will be 100.18 Centimeters. Not a whole lot. If you're going from 20 degrees to you know boiling point of water and it expands 0.18 square centimeters of control. <coughs> Are all materials linear? Like like if you heat something up so much, you know, it can try to I, I think I think if you went to the extremes that linear behavior would um, not be there. So I think we're, we're talking about small scale, small scale, you know, normal um, conditions. Linear behavior will break down in extreme conditions. All right. So that's uh, one thing today. That's the main thing today so far is just this linear expansion coefficient. Materials. Um, the second main thing is the ideal gas. And you probably have seen this before. <coughs> the equation state for an ideal gas. An ideal gas is a relatively low density gas. So again, we're talking about normal conditions, not extreme conditions. A low density gas, and all gases in this kind of low density would behave this way. 
and it's governed by this. PV equals nRT, T being pressure, V being volume, N is the number of moles of the gas, R is the gas constant, and T is the temperature. Your variables, the true variables in this, for most situations, is going to be your pressure, the volume of the gas, and your temperature, given that you have a certain amount of gas. R being a constant, you have a certain amount of gas, and it will be a constant as well. And it's the number of moles of the gas. You can get the number of moles by uh, the total mass of the gas and divide that by the mass per mole, the molar mass of, for that gas. And that will give you how many moles you have. Moles is a number. And the molar mass you get off of any uh, periodic table. The P is measured in Pascal's which would be newtons per meter square. And volume is measured in cubic meters. So we're all within the SI system here. And your gas constant, R, is 8.31 joules per mole per degree Kelvin. So you memorize that, 8.31. If you're in the SI system using pure SI units like newtons and meters cubed and Kelvin. If you use particular units, uh, pressure and atmospheres, and volume in liters, and liter being 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters, and pressure and atmosphere is just about 10 to the 5 pascals. So you're talking about a factor of 10 to the 5 for pressure, and a factor of 10 to the minus 3 for volume, you end up with a gas constant that looks very similar, but it's two orders of magnitude less. It's 0 0.0821 uh, liter atmospheres per mole per degree Kelvin. That's why they're very similar, because true atmospheric pressure would be about 1.013 times 10 to the 5. And then liters is a strict conversion of 10 to the minus 3. So it's that 1.013 that changes this from Digits of 831 and 821. So let's try this out. What is the volume of one mole of gas at standard pressure, one atmosphere, and temperature, which would be 0 degrees centigrade or 273 degrees Kelvin? You probably want to use the Kelvin scale for all. Um, applications of um, ideal gas. PV equals NRT. So the volume will equal NRT divided by P. I'm going to have one mole of gas at one atmosphere. So I'm going to use the uh, <coughs> second uh, gas constant, 0 0.0821, which is in liters atmosphere. And uh, temperature of 273 degrees Kelvin. Uh, one atmosphere, 22.4 liters. Any ideal gas, uh, whether it be a molecular gas, an atomic gas, um, if it's under these standard conditions, it should occupy 22.4 liters. Note that for any particular enclosed gas, the amount of gas would be constant. So your number of moles would be constant. And, and for 99% of the problems that you would deal with an ideal gas law, that's probably what's going to happen. Is you're not going to change the amount of gas that you have. You're just going to subject it to the state problems of either pressure, volume, or temperature. So if I start with that assumption, that I have an enclosed gas. Then I would say my initial pressure times initial volume equals NR, initial temperature. But I would also say 
that my final pressure, final volume, equals nR final temperature. If I took the ratio of these two equations, n being the same, because it's enclosed, the nRs cancel out, I can rearrange and get this nice expression right here. That my initial pressure times my initial volume over my initial temperature is a constant equals my final pressure over my final volume or my final temperature. For any enclosed gas, you can start from this equation and for these ideal gas law uh, problems, all you would need to do is just manipulate this equation for your final variable. Very nice. Let's try this out. Let's squeeze the tank of gas. Pure helium gas admitted to a leak-proof cylinder containing a movable piston. The initial volume, pressure, and temperature of the gas are 15 liters, 2 atmospheres, and 300 degrees Kelvin. But the volumes decrease to 12 liters, and the pressures increase to 3.5 atmospheres. Find the final temperature of the gas. Well, it's a contained uh, gas, so the the number of moles won't change. So the nice thing is I can get rid of the N and the R, so I don't have to worry about which gas constant to use. Right? And I set up this equation. PV over T initially equals PV over T finally. Now as long as my pressures are the same units, and as long as my volumes are the same units, then um, you know, if, if that's not what I'm looking for, then those units will cancel out because they're on either side. In this case, I'm looking for the final temperature. So solid for the final temperature, bring that up or to the left and bring all the other quantities to the right. And I have P final, V final, over P initial, V initial, times the initial temperature. My final pressure was 3.5 atmospheres. My initial pressure was two atmospheres. The atmospheres canceled out. If they had been in, uh, Pascals, that would cancel out as well. So units would just cancel out right there. Volume is, uh, final volume is two, 12 liters. Initial volume is 15 liters. Initial temperature is 300 degrees Kelvin. So after all this, my final temperature would be 420 degrees Kelvin. So, very useful. Just start with this, solve for your unknown quantity. little note about Avogadro's number. We're talking about a mole of gas, which is a quantity of gas. How much is that? Six point zero two two times 10 to the 23. I oftentimes I don't quite remember whether it's 2.2 or 2.3, so I'm just saying it's 6.023 times 10 to the 23. I, for some reason, that gets it straight from me. But, um, 6.022 to 23 molecules per mole. And 50 atoms per mole is on top of gas. So that's how many, that's the number of particles you have in one mole of something. So if you had a number of moles of gas, you, your number of moles would be your total number of particles divided by how many particles there are per mole. <coughs> and so you could get uh, your number of total number of particles would be equal to your number of moles times Avogadro's number. This is definitely a number that you should memorize. Like I said, it's okay if you go 6.023 times 1023. Probably better if you do it the right way, 6.022 times 1023. Just keep it straight. Uh, we might not use this right away, but uh, we'll use it later on. With this uh, definition of Avogadro's number, then the number of moles is the total number of particles divided by Avogadro's number. And so I can rewrite the gas all like this. But uh, I would also note then that um, I can rewrite it like this, where I'm going to introduce a new constant, K-Boltzmann 
which is equal to our gas constant R divided by Oppsdorfer's number. So if our gas constant was 8.31, and I divide that by 6.022 times 10 to the 23, I get Boltzmann constant, which is another universal constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Another constant that is good to know. If you put it in this form, um, you would note that this K Boltzmann is joules per Kelvin, and you're going to multiply that by temperature, which is Kelvin. So K Boltzmann times temperature is going to give you units of joules. N is just the number of particles that you have. So you're just going to be multiplying a number by units of joules. End result is its energy. Right? And so you can also say that pressure times volume is the energy involved with that gas. So that's going to come up with joules. All right, let's try another uh, problem using the gas law. There's another problem. One mole of oxygen gas is at a pressure of six atmospheres, temperature of 27 degrees Celsius, which translates to 300 degrees Kelvin. And the gas is heated at constant volume until the pressure triples. What is the final temperature? Well, we have contained gas, so the number of moles doesn't change. We heat it up. And so this equation is valid. PV over T initially equals PV over T finally. We want to find the final temperature, so let's solve this for T final. T final will equal the final pressure times final volume over initial pressure times initial volume times the initial temperature. If all the units are the same, then, uh, then the units will cancel out, at least with the pressure and the volume. Pressure was to go, was to triple, and the volume will stay constant. So our final pressure is three times the initial pressure. Initial pressure we'll just call P, but those P's will cancel out. And the volume is constant as well. So those will cancel out. And so our final temperature is just three times 300, or 900 degrees Kelvin. Nick has a uh, body of the. Uh, oh, okay, do you mean that? Uh, okay. Let's, let's start with uh, number one. Thermometers are calibrated at one degree Celsius, the other in degrees Fahrenheit. At what temperature in Kelvin do the readings measure the same temperature? I know from our uh, conversion of the temperature in Fahrenheit, 
And then when that increases the temperature in Celsius, plus 32, that's our conversion. We want to find the temperature in Kelvin where the Fahrenheit and the, and the Celsius temperature are the same. So let's just uh, make the assumption that they are the same temperature, some temperature T. Let's find out what T is. Right. So we'll put it in there. So T is equal to 9 fifths T plus 32. Bring 32 over here. Negative 32 will equal 9 fifths T minus T, or 4 fifths T. So T will equal 5 fourths times negative 32. It must be 5 times a negative 8, or negative 40 degrees. And that would be either Fahrenheit or If we want to find the temperature in Kelvin that corresponds to that, um, we've got a conversion, a nice conversion from Kelvin to Celsius or vice versa. In other words, temperature in Kelvin is equal to temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. But you don't have to put 0.15 on here, I would understand. Um, but in there just for the moment. So in this case, the temperature in Kelvin would be negative 40, that's 273.15, which would be uh, 233.15 degrees Kelvin. So at 233.15 degrees Kelvin, degrees Kelvin? Temperature in Fahrenheit is the same as temperature in Celsius. Let's try. Uh, let's try another one. First page on this uh, problem set deals with uh, the zeroth law. Just temperature. Second page deals with linear expansion. Let's try one of those. Take a look at number six. Made with segments of concrete 50 meters long. If the linear expansion coefficient is 12 times 10 to the minus 6, how much spacing in the centimeters is needed to allow for expansion during an extreme temperature change of 150 degrees Fahrenheit? We have concrete and the expansion coefficient is 12 times 10 to the minus 6. per degree Celsius, or per Kelvin. We have extreme temperature change of 150 degrees Fahrenheit, or change in temperature in Fahrenheit. It's going to be 150 degrees Fahrenheit. We want to uh, convert that to uh, temperature change in Celsius. So we would say that our temperature change in Celsius will equal five ninths temperature change in Fahrenheit. That'd be five ninths times 150, which would be 750 divided by nine. Is 
If I were to build this bridge, if I were a civil engineer, design this bridge, it's 50 meters long, so I'd want to have some space in there, maybe about 5 centimeters, to allow for the expansion on a hot day. That's the temp is going to change 150 degrees Fahrenheit. I guess I could if you're up in Minnesota. I mean, as far as it gets out to minus 50 and it goes up to 100. About 100 in the summer, so could change that much. Space. <clears throat> what was the expansion coefficient for steel? Remember? Uh, steel. The one that we gave in the notes was, was 11 times 10 minus 6. So I guess that would kind of support that rebar theory. Change a little bit, find the right construction of the concrete, and have set the expansion the same. Now right, let's try a, an ideal gas law. change in pressure, the temperature increases by 50 degrees Celsius. Let's try this. Um, initial pressure, initial volume, equals NR, T initial. And we're looking for the change in pressure, so we're not looking for a specific value. Final pressure, final volume, equals NR, final temperature. So I could rewrite this say that the initial temperature, pressure, I'm sorry, equals NR over initial volume times initial temperature, and the final pressure equals NR over final volume, these are the same volumes, times the final temperature. So I could say my change in pressure would equal my final pressure minus my initial pressure, and that will equal NR over the volume times our final temperature minus our initial temperature. Just take this minus this. So that's going to equal NR over volume times the change in temperature. Change in pressure number of moles, which I think was just one mole, when 
ideal gas. Number of mole times, and everything's in terms of uh, liters, volumes in terms of liters. So I'm going to use R as 0 0.0821 over 1 liter times a change in temperature of 50 degrees. I get 4.105 atmosphere. Answer B. I knew it would be atmospheres because I had to be uh, forced to use the, the second gas constant because we're dealing with liters. at uh, 14. One mole of an ideal gas is a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. If the volume is held constant and the pressure is doubled, what would be the final temperature? Volume initial equals volume final equals volume. And final pressure twice the initial pressure. We have an ideal gas and the initial temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, which would be uh, 25 plus 273 or 298 Kelvin. Initial, B initial, or T initial is a constant. That's equal to P final, B <coughs> final, or T final for a gas that's enclosed um, and not changing its, its amount. We want to find the final temperature. Rearrange that for the final temperature. We'll bring it up to the left, we'll bring the other terms to the right. The final temperature, what do you call T final, V final, or P initial, V initial, times T initial. Final pressure is twice the initial pressure, so we have 2P over P. Final volume is the same as the initial volume, so we have V over V. Initial temperature is 298 Kelvin. Like I said, we've got to be very careful. We want to use the Kelvin scale for all temperatures, and not to use the Celsius scale because uh, those, those ratios won't work. Two times two ninety eight gives us uh, five ninety six Kelvin. The question was, um, what's the final temperature in degrees Celsius? So there's five ninety six Kelvin, which would be five ninety six minus two seventy three equals. 23 degrees Celsius. Answer B. <coughs> what do you think? I think that's a good start. That's a, that's a whole chapter, 19. It's um, two main things. It's the linear expansion, the ideal gas law. Know those things, work out this problem set, and uh, we can start.
spend a little bit of time looking at old problem sets at the beginning of class next time, and we'll go on to the next chapter. Um, there's old problem sets online, so if you have a particular problem you want to look at, go online to that site that we talked about, and find the problem set. I don't know how you fast forward through the video. It's anyway. simple. It's just uh, calhoun.edu forward slash M-A-T-H. Uh, but I mean, once you get the video going, to you open it. those video player or whatever, so yeah. then you just fast forward like this. Oh, like any? Any? Okay. Um, we'll see you on Monday. John Matt.